Who do you call when you want to grow balsam apples, an exotic Asian vine grown by none other than Thomas Jefferson? This rare example of early 18th-century gardening is preserved by the workers at the Thomas Jefferson Center for Historic Plants at Monticello. Peggy Cornett is the director. Jefferson once wrote that the greatest service could be rendered any country is to add a useful plant to its culture. The center maintains over 350 plant varieties that have a connection to Jefferson or the time in which he lived. Cornett outlines the center's mission. It was um, an, a vision of one of our board members and uh, and the director of Gardens and Grounds, Peter Hatch. We decided to develop a program that would focus uh, on collecting and preserving historic plant varieties and making them available to the public and to educating the public about the importance of a lot of these old varieties that we've collected. And we do a lot of uh, work as far as as, as maintaining plants in our collections, even if, if we don't offer them for sale. There are some that are one of a kind or they're very unusual and we just keep them here um, uh, for the future. To help spread the word, Cornet often gives talks to interested groups and the center publishes an annual journal called The Twin Leaf, conducts workshops for Monticello's Saturdays in the Garden series, holds an annual open house and hosts a biennial historic plant symposium. But the heart of the operation is the center's headquarters at Tufton Farm, one of Jefferson's satellite farms about two miles down from Monticello. There's a greenhouse and a nursery with cold frames to protect plants over the winter. Cornett and her staff look after a wide variety, from house plants to perennials, shrubs, fruit, and even trees. We do grow tulip poplars from his original tree, which is still standing, or what we call the original tree, that still stands next to Monticello. It's an enormous tree. Though the center sells seedlings propagated from the original tree, the primary goal of nurturing its offspring is to help preserve the direct link to Jefferson. Cornett says nearly all the plants grown at the center have connections to the early American past. Some of the plants are rare or difficult to obtain, and some plants just have a provenance or a connection with a a historical figure or a place, and they may not be all that rare, but we have propagated them from the plants uh, from the site, so that makes them a little special. Jefferson was a curious botanist and sought out exotic species from around the globe, corresponding with the world's finest horticultural and botanical minds. Jefferson not only helped shape the nation's government, he also affected its biological makeup. He was likely the first American to grow the golden rain tree in America. He, he obtained um, seeds from his friend uh, in France, and uh, they were had just been introduced uh, to the West from China in the um, late 17, early 1800s. And so Jefferson received seeds and he was successful in germinating them. And it has naturalized in our landscape and it grows in fields and along roadsides. And many people think it's a a native plant, but it's actually an introduced uh, species that has has uh, adapted to our our environment here. Cornett says Jefferson's tastes were inspired by his travels. When he was the American minister to France, he spent some of his time in England. Back in Virginia, Jefferson grew plants from all over the world, including a unique bean originally native to the tropics that is now also in the CHP greenhouse. It's called the Caracalla bean or the Vigna Caracalla. And he said it was the most beautiful bean in the world. And um, its common name is not very pleasant. It's called the snail flower. But you can see why it's called that, because the flower kind of curls around itself like the the back of a snail. Beautiful flowers, they, they start out, uh, white uh, and blushed with purple, and then they they expand and and get a kind of a creamy quality to them. But the and their fragrance is 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 quite remarkable. They smell like uh, wisteria. And you can smell them at a great distance away. Cornet says the snail flower, also known as corkscrew vine, is a popular specimen at Monticello. It's available today thanks to CHP detective work. It was grown for uh, during the 19th century, and then even into the early 20th century, you would read about it in some of the garden literature. But then it it uh, kind of went out of popularity or or favor and. Um, wasn't really mentioned or offered for sale uh, throughout, you know, the 20th century, as far as we can tell. We were able to track seed down from a, a, a seed company in England, actually, and uh, they were quite expensive, the, the seeds that we originally purchased. And from those first few seeds, it was less than 10 seeds, we started growing plants, and um, uh, I really, we, we sell probably a 1,000 plants of these a year. It's amazing. 
Cornette says it's often hard to tell what certain species might have looked like when they were blooming for Jefferson, but sometimes her team is aided by specimens captured in portraits, as in the case of one geranium from South Africa that first arrived in North America in the late 18th century. We have a great documentation of this particular geranium because it's actually in a painting that Rembrandt Peel uh, made of his brother Rubens. And um, these were two sons of Charles Wilson Peel. Charles Wilson Peel was a friend of Jefferson's, and it was made, it was painted in 1801. The geraniums of that time did not quite look like the ones we're used to today. Today's blossoms are the hybridized forms, which have been bred to be larger and more colorful. One flower more popular during Jefferson's time was the heliotrope. The heliotrope was a flower that Jefferson said, said the smell rewards the care. I suspect he, he meant that because it's a, it's a plant that if you want to grow it as a house plant, you have to fuss with it quite often and take the dead leaves off and pinch it and so forth. But it, it's also a very nice garden plant. Um, we grow it in the garden and has a, a very, very sweet fragrance, uh, sort of like a cherry pie was one of the names for it. Um, this is a white form that smells a lot like, like vanilla. But Cornette says Jefferson was mostly interested in finding new crops to grow in Virginia. He's particularly known for trying to popularize one of our most popular fruits. He could be considered a pioneer American in, in the fact that he, he was not afraid to eat the tomato. Many people thought it was a poisonous plant. Um, and in fact, it is in the in the nightshade family which uh, has a number of poisonous plants in it. But he, he of course, had traveled and, and uh, knew that the tomato was an important uh, part of the uh, Italian cuisine, for example, and he was growing tomatoes, uh, I think, beginning around 1809 or so until the end of his life. Other agricultural experiments included citrus. It was common in the day to try to grow tropical fruit in a temperate climate. Jefferson had an orangery and also tried growing several large shrubs, such as the yellow-flowered sweet acacia. While Jefferson mostly tried to grow things that were practical, there were some exceptions, like the balsam apple, a tropical fruit from Asia. It, it's an it's a annual vine that grows very quickly once it warms up. It's, it's, it, it will cover an arbor quite quickly. It has kind of... Um, pale yellow flowers that are that are, are very very attractive and very shiny serrated foliage as you can see here and then but the the, the real attraction of this plant uh, um, would be the, the fruits that it forms um, later in the season they start out uh, green and then they turn to orange and then as they get uh, riper, they'll turn almost almost a reddish orange, and then once the the the, the fruit is really ripe, they they will literally pop open on the plant, and um, and it exudes these these sticky seeds, and we have to clean that that sticky coating off of the seed um, to to save them. Um, but it's it's a plant that Jefferson grew in his garden, even though uh, we would consider it a curious plant today. And Jefferson said he. He didn't have time for mere curiosities, but he was actually cultivating this in his garden. And it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a great plant for, for children um, because it's just very, it's so curious. People love it. You know, they see it growing at Monticello and, and they immediately want it uh, when they go down to the garden shop. The center also maintains special gardens dedicated to particular species. One octagonal garden contains a history collection of early American rose varieties. Cornett says this garden tells the story of how American roses got started. They're called Noisette roses, but uh, they're actually um, uh, some of the first roses developed in, in this country. Roses are a good, a good example of a, um, plants that have, have evolved and, and, and have been highly bred or hybridized o over the last uh, several centuries. And so even by the 1800s, there were a lot of um, very fine um, varieties already available. Um, but a lot of the old varieties that we, we have, uh, have a lot of the old rose varieties that we have were, were once blooming varieties. They bloomed in the, in the springtime. They were European for the most part. And by the, uh, by, by the late 1700s and early 1800s, some of the roses from China were being introduced, and they had the quality of blooming constantly. Part of her work is to trace the histories of plants like the Noisette rose. Cornette says this rose was first noticed in Charleston, South Carolina, on the plantation of a Mr. John Champneys. And he, knew, he recognized that it had very desirable qualities. And so he was uh, sharing his seedlings with friends. And his neighbor, uh, Philippe Noisette, 
was a Frenchman, and uh, and his brother Philippe's brother Louis lived in Paris, and he had a rose he was a rose breeder, and he had a rose nursery. So Philippe sent these cuttings or seedlings back to his um, brother, and who then began hybridizing it uh, on a big scale, and so. The whole class of roses are called noisette roses, but um, which is a French family name, but it, it's actually uh, an American hybrid. It originated in America. The goal of the Center for Historic Plants is to preserve these early roses. Cornette says many of them are now gone, preserved only in places like Tufton Farm in Monticello. Well, for our purposes, it's it's very important um, to represent the plants that Jefferson grew. So we don't want to grow a modern marigold in, or a petunia in the gardens at Monticello, it just would not look right. It would, it would be like having something from Ikea uh, in Jefferson's dining room. It just would not look right. And in the interest of advancing the field, Cornette does consulting for other historic sites across the country, advising on what plants are appropriate for different periods in American history. She says historic plants are less noticed artifacts of times gone by. These plants tell our own story, and if if we're only growing mo- the latest and newest modern hybrid, we really don't see what our grandmothers grew or what our ancestors grew. And so in, in that regard, I think it's important to um, carry on your, your, your traditions and your family legacies. The Thomas Jefferson Center for Historic Plants is located at Tufton Farms, two miles from Monticello, and operates a plant shop on the grounds of Thomas Jefferson's home across from the ticket office. You can learn more about the center by visiting www.monticello.org chp or at www.twinleaf.org, where you'll find past articles from the center's journal Twin Leaf, as well as links to seeds and plants from its collection in the online Monticello shop. For Monticello, I'm Sean Tubbs.